Amen. You may be seated. So my name is Brad. I'm the teaching elder here at The Way. Welcome to The Way. And, uh, and I say this all the time, but there's no place I would rather be this morning than right here with you all. Uh, of course, if you're a member of The Way, we expected to see you here. We have some visitors here. Welcome to you all as well. If you have your copy of God's Word, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 5 today. Joe mentioned it briefly as we continue our study in the Sermon on the Mount in our larger series, First Love, as we remind ourselves of our first love, and we talked about who Jesus was for many months, and now we're talking about the things that Jesus says. So if you have your copy of God's Word, we'll be in Matthew chapter 5, and we're going to focus on a single beatitude today, just like we did last week, and really, since you all are going along with me in memorization, you shouldn't even need to open your Word of God, because you should be well past the beatitudes at this point in time, right? So, and in all seriousness, what a challenge, uh, for those of you that haven't heard this before, I challenged our congregation to memorize the Sermon on the Mount with me, along with me, I'm working on it, less than a verse a day, less than one verse a day, uh, there's 107 verses in the Sermon on the Mount, and we will be in the Sermon on the Mount past 107 days, so I'm just past the Beatitudes, I'm working on it, I'm not a naturally good uh, I don't have a naturally good memory, so I really have to work at it, and so maybe you're the same. Uh, but what power that is to have the Word of God impressed upon your mind and your heart and in your memory. I mean, what a, what a powerful thing that is. So we're going to be in Matthew chapter 5, verse 4 today, where we talk about how we feel. And so there's a lot going on in the church today when it comes to how people feel. There's a temptation in the church, the Western church anyway, to try to cultivate a certain type of feeling inside of the people, and really the way that people feel is a means to an end. If I can generate a certain feeling in you, and that could be a means to a desired end, and what I desire is for you to be in the seats, for your tithe checks to be in the offering plate, for you to participate in our ministries. And so if you come here and I can I can generate a feeling in you, in you and you can leave here feeling empowered, Empowered and, and, and enabled and in other ways like that, then, then maybe that will achieve those ends. But I'm not sure that Jesus would agree with us that that is how we should go about doing ministry. So this is the message. Matthew 4, 17. It tells us that Jesus began to proclaim in Galilee, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is the message, Matthew 4, 17. And we've got to proclaim this message at all times with words. Because how will they believe if they never hear the word of God? We've got to speak these words of, lives, uh, words of life. And this is prescriptive. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You want to be in the kingdom of heaven. This is how you do it. You repent and believe upon the Lord Jesus. And then our lives serve to validate our words. It's not the other way around. We can't preach Jesus with our lives, but our lives have to validate these words. And people might say, well, what's it like in the kingdom of heaven? Well, what are things like there? And you say, well, let me show you. This is how things are like in the kingdom of heaven. Look at how I live. Let me tell you, in the Sermon on the Mount is a window into the kingdom of heaven. Well, let me tell you what people are like in the kingdom of heaven. If you remember from last week and we opened in the Beatitudes, that the Beatitudes are descriptive. They describe people in the kingdom of heaven. Well, let me tell you, the people in the kingdom of heaven are poor in spirit. People in the kingdom of heaven, they mourn. They are meek. They hunger and thirst for righteousness. They're merciful. They are pure in heart. They are peacemakers. And they are persecuted. This is what people are like in the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus is proclaiming the message of Matthew 4, 17. He goes up on the mountain. He sits down and his disciples come to him and he opens his mouth and he starts by saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And we're going to camp out on Matthew chapter 5, verse 4 today. As we talk about mourning, and I entitled this message, Good Grief. And Joe, when I said that, he sent me a Charlie Brown meme. <laughs> Does anybody even know who Charlie Brown is? Okay, young men, y'all know who Charlie Brown is? I get some yeah. nods here. Seriously? Yes. Really? Obviously. I mean, like, I, you know Charlie Brown? Okay, we got to, okay, I didn't think anybody knew. So this is not the exclamation that Charlie Brown used to do, you know, good grief. 
We're talking about good grief. We're talking about godly grief today when we talk about mourning. Because Jesus tells us, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And we're going to dig into what Jesus means by these words. What does it mean to mourn? What does it mean to truly grieve? To lament. So we have a dear brother in Christ from this church who is mourning right now. He, uh, Nathan Pollock, the Pollock family, suffered a terrible loss in their family this week. And we are grieving along with them. They're mourning. Why are they mourning? They're mourning because of a loss. They have lost something. And in this case, they have lost a loved one, a, a cherished family member uh, left them and was taken from them. And so we mourn and we grieve normally something that is lost. Well, what is it that we have lost here? When Jesus tells us, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And so what we, and we're going to talk about this mourning and, and why we mourn and how we mourn and what it means to mourn. But as a believer upon the Lord Jesus, what I mourn is the loss of everything. Paradise loss, literally. And we're talking about mourning sin. Mourning sin. Let's talk about that for just a little bit. We've got to define our terms right up front a little bit. Because people get confused when you talk about sin versus sins. Let's, let's make sure we clarify exactly what we are talking about before we talk about mourning. So sins are the, the individual acts that we do that violate the word of God. God has said this is the way. He has given us his word to teach us the way. And when we violate that word, those are sins. Sins. Those are individual things that we do. Not to be confused with sin, which is the condition that is universal in scope and application to every man, woman, and child who has ever lived. And that is a corruption of our heart that is bent against God. It started with original sin, which is in the garden. Now, original sin was not the commission of the first sin. Original sin is that condition that entered into the heart of all men since that point in time, whereby we reject the ways of God universally. Original sin or sin is a condition. It's a disease. It is a sickness that afflicts every single person that has ever walked the face of the earth, that has ever walked this planet. This is original sin versus the sins that we commit. And so when we mourn, we are mourning sin in a number of different ways. Let's dig into some of these ways just a little bit. We talk about good grief and godly grief. We mourn the sin of the world. We mourn the sin of the world. Think about creation itself. Scripture tells us that the very creation groans under the weight of sin. And so we mourn that corruption of creation. We mourn bone cancer in children. I mourn that there is bone cancer in children and I grieve because it is the sin of men that has corrupted and twisted creation. That's what scripture tells us, that, that creation is twisted by sin and is corrupted by sin. And that's why we have things like disease and cancer and hurricanes and tornadoes and earthquakes and other things that take life. And so we ought to mourn the corruption of creation, the sin of the world. But more than that, we ought to mourn the sin of people, the sin of the lost. I find no mandate in Scripture. I find zero mandate in Scripture for anger against the lost. I find zero mandate for that. Listen to what Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 18. He's talking about the lost. He says, for many of whom I've told you, speaking of the lost, and now tell you with tears. Paul tells them with tears about the lost. He says, they walk as enemies of the cross. They're enemies of the cross. And let me tell you about it. He says their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. They glory in their shame. And they have their minds set on earthly things. We ought to mourn the sin of the world. And why do we mourn the sin of the world? What does it mean to mourn the sin of the world? Well, you got these culture wars going on today, right? you got all these culture. I mean, there's a deep divide in our nation today. Our nation is drifting left and it is drifting right. You have the godless policies on the left and it's easy to look at those and say these 
pro-choice policies, these other policies that support godlessness are godless. But let me tell you, on the right side of the political aisle, there are people who are just as godless who lash out against those on the left in anger. And I find no prescription for anger against the lost in Scripture. Paul says we talk about them with tears because they are enemies of the cross of Christ. We mourn the sin of the world. We don't get involved in these cultural, cultural wars. It's so tempting, though, because the godless are everywhere. They are injecting godlessness into every facet of society. They're attempting to legislate godlessness. If your children are in the public schools, they are trying to teach your children godlessness. Anywhere in the public court, they are trying to proclaim and legislate godlessness. And it's tempting to respond with anger, with hatred, with vitriol. But I find no prescription for that in Scripture. I find a prescription for mourning, for compassion. Because these people are enemies of the cross of Christ. The cross, the message of the cross is foolishness to them. They cannot see the glory of Christ. They do not possess the power to not sin. And they will not come to Jesus apart from a move of the Holy Spirit and God himself. They are powerless and helpless. They are like sheep truly without a shepherd. So you have to mourn the lost because scripture tells us that they are daily marching to the slaughter. I want to use my wife as a scripture or as a sermon illustration again. <laughs> I used her on Wednesday night in Bible studies. I think she's in the crying room. She'll probably stick her head out to see what I'm getting ready to say here in a second. But, uh, so my wife is a nurse, and she's the best nurse in Clarksville. Uh, I didn't know that. And, and where she works, uh, there's a new gal that works where she works. And this gal does not know the Lord. And additionally, she uh, responds or, or deals with people, including my wife, in a very, uh, you know, <laughs> condescending manner. She talks down to people. She talks poorly to people. She treats people in a certain way that is not good. And she's new. <laughs> you know, it's like the new guy showing up and talking down to people. It's like, wait a minute, new guy. And so it would be tempting, right, to respond in a certain way. But how would Jesus see this gal? Would he see her the same way that Paul sees her as an enemy of the cross of Christ? Her God is her belly. She glories in her shame. Her mind is set on earthly things and her end is destruction. We don't respond to the lost with anger. We mourn the sin of the world. That is good and godly grief. That's not what I want to talk about today. Let's talk about the sin of the church. Sin of the world, that's easy to talk about. Let's talk about the sin of the church. Listen to Psalm 119, 136. The psalmist says, my eyes shed streams of tears. My eyes shed streams of tears because people do not keep your law. We don't expect the lost to, to keep the law of God. We expect lost people to act like lost people. But here the psalmist says, my eyes shed streams of tear because your people, God, do not keep your word. I'm talking about the sin of the church. We ought to mourn the sin of the church, the corruption of believers, individual believers. Let's talk about that. There's a great example in the book of 1 Corinthians. So. If you ever think your church is messed up, if you ever think this church is messed up, <laughs> we, we do some things well and some things not so well. I don't think we're messed up. But if you ever read 1 Corinthians, that is a messed up church right there. And, and, and so if I ever feel bad about the church, it's like I go to 1 Corinthians. Like, oh, okay, good. We're not doing too poorly. And there's a lot going on in the church at Corinth. And in, in this particular letter, uh, there is a man who is engaged in Congress with his father's wife doesn't specify if it's his mother or not but his father's wife and Paul addresses them on this issue and he's, he's surprised that this this behavior is not even tolerated amongst the pagans this this behavior is so horrific even those who hate God don't act in this fashion he says for you though you are arrogant the people are, look how tolerant we are toward this behavior. He says to them, ought you not rather to mourn? Shouldn't you be mourning the sin of your brother in Christ? Shouldn't you be mourning 
your brother who's fallen into sin. So listen, as a, as a believer, you know, the, the scripture tells us that when one member of our body suffers, we all suffer. And somebody who is languishing under the weight of sin is always suffering. There's always suffering happening. And so when we look at a brother or sister of Christ who's fallen into sin, we don't look to them with condemnation. We mourn that. We look and we mourn that they have fallen out of the light and into the darkness for some reason. And what that does is that that develops a right spirit within us. It makes us gentle in spirit if we mourn their sin so that when we go to them to restore them, because that's what God tells us to do. We do this with a right spirit. We ought to mourn the corruption of our brothers and sisters in Christ. We ought to mourn the corruption of the body itself. Let's go back to Ezra. Do you remember Ezra? I remember Ezra. I love Ezra. So if you remember in Ezra that, that God had, had judged his people and sent them into exile in Babylon. And he raises up Ezra and Nehemiah and Zerubbabel and some other leaders to lead them back into Jerusalem. Just as he promised he would do. And he does exactly that. He delivers the people back to Israel, back to Jerusalem, just like he said he would. And what do the people do? Immediately upon returning in Ezra chapter 9, it tells us that they did not separate themselves from the peoples of the land and their abominations. They've taken some of their daughters to be wives for themselves and for their sons so that the holy race has mixed itself with the peoples of the land. And listen to this. This breaks my heart. And in this faithlessness, the hand of the officials and chief men has been foremost. The leaders of the people of God led them back into sin immediately upon being delivered by God. And so Ezra sees this and hears it. He tears his garments and his cloak. He pulls his hair from his head. He rips, it. He rips his beard out. That's some mourning right there. That's some anguish. And he sat appalled. And those who trembled with him, they returned and they sat appalled until evening. And then he prays, oh God, I am ashamed and blushed. To, I can't even lift my face to you, God. And it says in chapter 10 that the, the people, when they heard him weeping, they, they went to him and they gathered with him and they all wept bitterly. That is a picture of us mourning the sin of the church. And so my question today is, do we mourn the sin of the church when I see the Western church in particular that has the capacity, the capacity to take the gospel to the ends of the earth, but not the will? When I see the Western church filled Every seat filled with casual, comfortable Christians who are content to consume. That's some alliteration right there, right? Christians who are content to show up every Sunday and be fed. We ought to mourn that when I see a church that has a thousand times of the capacity to give every single orphan a home. But not the will. Do you know this is National Foster Care Awareness Month? There are thousands of children available for homes right here. Hundreds of them right here in Clarksville. But when I see the church that turns a blind eye to that, I mourn. And so we ought to mourn the church, the, the sin of the church, the corruption of the believer, and the corruption of the body of Christ. And this is good and godly grief. This is good mourning. But that's not what I really want to talk about today. We can mourn the sin of the world. We can mourn the sin of the church. Let's move on to something a little tougher. I think we're ready for a little more meat, not as much milk. We have to mourn our own sin first, right? We have to mourn our own sin. A lot of people will turn to a chapter we'll get to later in the book of, uh, in, the, in I believe chapter 7. Judge not, lest you be judged, right? We shouldn't judge anybody, people will say. Well, that's not exactly what that scripture tells us. Jesus tells us when you look at your brother and you see a speck in their eye, look to your own eye. You got a log in your eye. Remove the log from your eye. And then you can help your brother remove the speck from their eye. How we view our sin. 
how a believer views his own sin is a great indicator of where they are in their walk. That is a great indicator of where they are in their walk. Let's think about our previous sin. We talk about how we view our own sin. Let's think about our previous sin. Now, maybe you were called to the Lord at a younger age, like my mother. My mother's testimony, she doesn't even remember being a non-believer. And praise and glory and honor be unto him if that is the case. Amen. Or maybe you're an adult convert like me. I look back, I was 33 when the Lord called me to faith, when he called me out of the darkness and into his marvelous light. I was 33 years old. And I mourned those years. I mourned those years. I don't know why, and I trust God's perfect and pleasing plan. I trust his sovereignty. I trust that. But I look for 33 years, I spent my life as a slave to sin and self. I spent my life serving anything but God. I was a rebel against God. I hated God at the core of my soul for 33 years. And I look back, I even actively persecuted those who were of the Lord. And I mourn that. Again, I trust the sovereignty of God. I trust that his plan is best. That his plan is good. I, I trust that about him. But I cannot help but mourn all of those years I spent apart from them. I know that there's a reason. I know that there's a perfectly good reason. I don't know what that is yet. Maybe it's so I can speak to somebody who has suffered similar to me. But I mourn that I spent so many years as a slave to my sin. You know, people really go one of two polar extremes when they talk about previous sin. There's people who dwell upon their sin. Maybe you dwell upon your sin this morning. Maybe you are defined by your sin. I know people who are so defined by their sin that the thought of being without that sin makes them uncomfortable. I've been committing this particular sin for so long, it's just become a part of who I am. I can't even think of myself apart from this particular sin. I am defined by this sin. And so we dwell upon our previous sin. That's one polar extreme. We're going to come back to that. The other extreme is that we cherish our sin. We cherish our sin. Sin is fun, right? Well, on the surface, it can seem to be fun. Again, back to myself as a, as a previous, uh, when I was a non-believer, uh, I was a member of kind of the party crowd. You know, we like to go out and go to the club and, and consume. Uh, we did a lot of binge drinking on the weekends and, and drunkenness and other debauchery. And, and on the surface, it's like, wow, that looked like we had a lot of fun. You know, I'm looking at my friends and, and you know, I think of the, the friends I had in those days. We had a lot of laughs and a lot of fun. Well, you know, when, when you look a little bit deeper at what this actually is, and we're going to talk about what this actually is. I mean, on the surface, there's some easy stuff. There's the thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars that I spent doing that, that I lament, that I mourn, that I wish I still had those resources today. And, 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 and behind the fun, behind the, 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 the debauchery and the laughter and all the good times that me and my buddies had in the pub was a all manner of affliction that was underneath all of that. And it was tearing my life and my marriage apart. But we were having fun. We can never look back at our sin and cherish our sin. May we never cherish our sin. What does it mean to mourn our sin? Let's get to our present. Let's get to today. Let's consider what it means when we actually sin. What does it mean to actually sin? We talked about it last week. If you are a believer upon the Lord Jesus, what have you been given? Everything. You have been given everything. God has come to you. He has called you out of the darkness. He's given you a new heart that you might believe. He has adopted you as a son. You're, you're a daughter of the king. You're a son of God. You didn't earn it. You didn't deserve it. He gave it to you. The keys to the kingdom of heaven. An unshakable kingdom that will never perish. He'll never take it away from you. He has given this gift that he will never take back to you. He's given you a new nature. You are a new creation. When I look back at the man that I was, I don't even know that man. He is a complete stranger to me. 
He has given all of that to me. And so when I sin, as a believer, I look at all that God has given me, all that he has done for me, including a new nature, and I say, no, thank you, God. I would rather do this. Every day, talk about free will. People talk about free will. Every day you exercise your free will. I exercise my free will, and that is my will to sin or not to sin. As a believer, I have a new nature, and I have to violate that nature to sin. That's what I do every single time I look at God. What I'm saying when I sin as a believer is I'm saying, God, I, I see all these things that you've given to me. I receive my citizenship in the kingdom of heaven. I see all of this wonderful blessings, this grace and mercy you've poured out upon me. But in this moment, God, I like this thing more than I like you. And really, I like myself more than I like God. Proverbs 26, 11 talks about the foolishness of a dog that returns to his vomit. When I sin, I am resolutely declaring to God, this vomit sure tastes good. And I'm returning to my vomit. I'm going to give you another sermon illustration. We, we did something like this last week. You've seen on TV these, uh, maybe, maybe you've been to a third world country and you've seen it yourself, uh, these children in some of these third world countries that uh, live in these slums and you know so when you go to Caja de Agua and Lima Peru maybe in the fall with me you'll see some of this, these children they live in these slums and, and they live in and amongst garbage and, and raw sewage you've seen these children right and, and but they're what are they doing they're they're playing they're like kicking a you know in, in, in Peru you'll see them they play soccer with like an empty water bottle that's their soccer ball and they're, and they're just having fun. They're, they're playing. And you're like, well, how can they have fun in this slum, in this garbage dump, in this raw sewage, and in amongst all this? Well, they don't know about anything else. That's, that's their existence. That's all they know. They've never been to the beach. What if we took them to the beach? The Florida coast, the, the beautiful white sands of the Florida coast. The, uh, have you been to the, the Panhandle? That's, have you seen the beach and, and how amazing it is and the, and the beautiful water? And, and they took them there and they were just, wow, look at this place. Let's, let's play here at the beach. This is wonderful. But at some point they're playing at the beach and they say, you know, I'd like to go back to the slum and, and, and play. I'd like to go back and play in the garbage. I'd like to go back and play in the when we sin, when we exercise our free will, when we decide to violate the law that, the God, that God has given to us, that is exactly what we are doing. We are turning our back on paradise to return to the garbage dump. When we think about our sin in that terms, we've got to mourn our sins, our acute sins, our calloused hearts. Do you have a calloused heart? Perhaps you have been participating in a sin. You have a certain thought pattern. You have a, a frame of mind, a habit, a thing that you do that you have done for so long that you have become callous to it. That doesn't really hurt anybody, right? We presume the forgiveness of God and we slander the grace of God and we rank order our sins. Rank ordering sin is the, is the business of people. You say, well, yeah, I do this one thing and I know that God doesn't want me to do this one thing, but I don't do these other things. And, and in the list of things, uh, the thing that I do is down here. It's not nearly as bad as the other things that are up here. This is the business of men when we rank order our sins. Do you have a callous heart today toward your sin? Has it become callous over time? I pray that the Lord would just rip that callous off of our hearts today that we would have a gushing wound out of our hearts as we truly mourn our sin. Think about how our fathers in the faith viewed their sin. Paul for Romans chapter 7, he's talking about the war between, between the law and sin inside of his heart. He says, I don't understand my own actions. I do not do what I want to do. I do the thing I hate. This is what Paul says. I do the thing he hates. He says, I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members Another law waging war against the law of the mind and taking me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. And then he says, wretched man that I am, 
from this body of death. This is how Paul viewed his own sin. I think of Isaiah in chapter 6 that talks about the call of Isaiah when he's confronted with the glory and the majesty of God. All he can do is say, woe is me. He calls down judgment upon himself because I am a man of unclean lips. That's all that Isaiah can do in that particular account. I think of David in Psalm 51. He, one of my favorite psalms. He, he writes this psalm after Nathan confronts him over his sin with Bathsheba. In Psalm 51, 4, he says, against you and you alone, God, have I sinned. David saw his sin for what it was. It was a direct offense against God. Yes, he sinned against Bathsheba. Yes, he sinned against Uriah. But he sinned against God. He saw his sin for what it is. And he wept over it. He mourned it. I think about the weeping of Jesus. Scripture describes two accounts where Jesus wept. And he's confronted with the hardness of heart of the hearts of the people as he raises Lazarus to death to life and he weeps over it when he's confronted by the sin of Jerusalem the collective sin and hardness of the hearts of the people Jesus wept and we ought to mourn our sin contrary to popular belief yes the Christian life is a life of joy unimaginable joy but there's a foundation of mourning we mourn paradise lost we mourn our sin collectively and conversely if we, you, me, can participate in that which we know is sin without any kind of conviction, any kind of little piercing of the heart, thought, conviction of the spirit. If we can continue to participate and participate and participate in sin with no mourning, I would never question your salvation. You tell me you're a believer, I say you're a believer. At the very least, we've got to ask ourselves some tough questions, some hard questions. How can I participate in this sin? And Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. It's interesting if you look at some translations, blessed is happy, mourning is sad. I mean, it almost says happy are those who are sad. Right? That kind of sounds paradoxical. But if you think about it, it makes sense. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Go back to Ezra. I love the words of Ezra. In the midst of all of this weeping over the corporate sin of the people, he says, Even now, there is hope for Israel. Even now, there is hope for Israel. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul talks about good and godly grief. That leads to repentance, that leads to salvation, that leads to life. When we grieve appropriately, when we mourn the way that Jesus tells us to mourn, it conditions our heart to repentance, which leads to salvation, which leads to life. Psalm 119, 50, the author tells us that this is my hope in my affliction, that your promise gives me life. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, John tells us that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. This is our hope. This is our comfort in our mourning of our sins. That God will remember our sins no more. What, when I view my sin the way it really is. When I truly mourn my sin for what it really is. When I, when I see my sin for how God sees it. When I confess my sin. And confession is not telling God about your sin. God already knows what your sin is. Confession is agreeing with God about your sin. And so when I do all of those things. When I think appropriately about my sin. The idea that God would remember my sin no more. Ought to floor me. I mean we ought to be standing on our feet for I mean, hallelujah right now. I mean, I'm, I'm up here telling you these things. And it's like, are you, are you people even hearing this? This is an amazing thing. That God would remember our sins no more. He can remember our sins. He's God. He, he knows them. He already knew them before you even did them. He chooses not to remember, not to hold us to account to them. When he looks at me, it is as I have never sinned. He is freeing us from the presence of sin. He freed us from the penalty of sin. And one day he will free us from the presence of sin. This is our comfort right here. We talked about Jesus a number of weeks ago. Maybe even months ago. That he is a God who sees you. 
He is a God who sees you right where you are at, and he is not content to leave you where you are. Like Hagar in the wilderness, cowering by the brook, by the, by the stream in the wilderness. And God goes to her, and he sees her, and he calls her to him. God is not content to leave you where you are in your sin. And this is comfort to us. This is comfort to us. And so this is our comfort in our affliction that his promise gives me life. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And so where are you at today? Do you mourn your sin? Do you mourn the sin of the world? You know, have you been angry at the sin of the world? At lost people for acting like lost people? Do you lash out at lost people? I see a lot of Christians lashing out at lost people for behaving like lost people. Now, we should hate injustice. I hate abortion. I hate abortion. It is a wicked blight upon this nation. But I don't hate the women that go through with this. Talk to me about it sometime afterward. I'll tell you why. Do we mourn the sin of the world? Do we mourn the sin of the church? Do we mourn our brothers and sisters when they fall into sin and do we mourn so much that we can't leave them there that we go to them to restore them and do we mourn our own sin does that drive us to live lives of repentance do you have callous sin on your heart what is it today that we need to repent of so he joined me as we pray lord we love you and we praise you God, I thank you so much, Jesus, for your words that penetrate right to our heart like a two-edged sword, dividing soul from spirit and bone from marrow. God, as we mourn our sin, as we mourn original sin, as we mourn collective sin, as we mourn our individual sins that we commit, God, I know that you have called us to purity, to holiness. And so, God, I pray that this church would collectively mourn sin and the corruption and the wickedness that comes from our sin. God, may we not be able to have calloused hearts. God, if we have a calloused heart toward our sin, even today, that you would rip that callous right off of our hearts. God, that you would call us out of the darkness. That you would call us to restoration. God, that you would call us to renewal. God, that you would be a God who sees us just like you say you are. And you would come to us in our sin. And we mourn this sin, but we are comforted in that. We are comforted that you come to us. You're not content to leave us in our sin. That you love us so much that you will call us out of that sin. So God, come to us today. This is our comfort and our affliction. Your promise gives us life. Come to us today and call us out of our sin. Maybe there's some here today that have a, a calloused heart. There's some here today that dwell on their sin or defined by their sin. That that would no longer be the case. God, that you would free us from that burden here this morning. Blessed are those who mourn, for we will be comforted. May we mourn our sin today. And God, if there's a single person here today that is still living as a slave to sin, God, that today would be the day that you call them to newness of life. That today would be the day that you would call them for good out of that darkness and your marvelous light. That today would be the day of salvation, Jesus. And all praise and glory and honor would be unto you. Lord, we love you and we praise you and we ask all these things in your holy name. Amen. So as we stand and as we sing, uh, if anybody would like to come and pray with me, I'll be right down front here. You can pray right where you're at. Uh, but we always respond to God's word either respond by saying no, being obedient. God's word always demands a response of us. As we stand